my friend here. We are back in Launceston. My sponsoring rural general practice placement is done. It finished on Friday and as of Monday, I start my general surgery rotation. And this guy is gonna be highly relevant to my placement. While you Google him, I'm gonna find somewhere to sit down and have a chat to you guys. We do a six week general surgery placement. Last year as a fourth year, we do placements in ortho, ENT, and plastics. In fifth year for us, general surgery entails colorectal surgery, upper GI surgery, and also thyroid and breast. So this general surgery rotation will be six weeks in total, but it will be broken up in the middle by one week of teaching, what we call a group learning week. That includes your standard lectures, case-based learning, CBLs, simulation sessions, and practice OSCE sessions as well. The second week in the middle will be our mid-semester break, which falls on Easter, and then we'll do our final three weeks. So we've got three weeks of surgery, one week of teaching, one week of a break, and then another three weeks of surgery. Within our general surgery rotation, we do two weeks of each of those subspecialties. There are a total of eight or nine fifth year medical students on general surgery at one time, and then we're divided into three different groups. We'll rotate through the subspecialties of surgery with two or three of us in a group at a time. For me, I'll be doing two weeks of colorectal first, then upper GI, then breast and thyroid. In addition to the regular hours, Monday to Friday of surgery, the expectation of my clinical school is that there will always be two students on call at any one time with the surgical team. One student will be with the intern and one student will be with a registrar. Dividing that up between the nine of us on general surgery, we end up doing about one on-call evening a week and then a few weekends each. When you're in these after-hour sessions, you're no longer in a subspecialty, you're covering all of general surgery. If you're on-call with the intern, you simply stay the whole shift. So we start at 6.45 and then we push on through until it's about 11 o'clock, doing the jobs on the ward after hours when the standard team has gone home. And if you're with the reg, then you'll be in theatre. With the reg, you're technically on call the whole night until the next shift starts at seven o'clock the next morning. The same goes on the weekends with the regs, but the interns have some slightly different shift times then. I'm not really sure how I'm gonna set up these videos given that I can't bring the camera to the hospital for you guys. So it might be built up with a bunch of sit downs with me, but hopefully I'll still be able to bring you some useful content that gives you a bit of an idea about what my lifestyle's like as a med student, what my workload is like, about the content that I'm learning, or the experiences that I'm having, positive or negative. But I'd really like to be guided by you guys as to what information you'd like to get from these videos. So please let me know in the comments Low if you've got a minute. A quick tip for any of you guys approaching your first surgical rotation, the ward rounds are really, really fast. The best thing that you can do as a medical student is be organized and be proactive. Grab the notes, grab some blood forms and imaging forms, listen to what's happening, pull out the OBS charts, and in particular in surgery, get ready to show the fluid status, and that will go a long way for you as a student to being actually able to help out the team. The most important thing to get down if you're writing the notes is the management plan. The rest can be done later. The most challenging thing for me on this placement will be work-life balance, because I have a lot of extra hobbies and interests. And between the hours that you do as a standard, and then on top of that, the on-call sessions, you're really not left with much extra time. During this rotation too, I would like to get in my five Final 3,000 word assignment. It's the same setup, a long case that I've been working on in my GP rotation, except this time it's going to be on an acute patient. The second case isn't actually due to the middle of June. They're not actually asking us to produce three 3,000 word assignments in two months, but it's something that I would like to get done so that I can do other things in the next months to come. So that's going to be taking up a lot of my time as well on this placement. All right, that's all for today. Wish me luck tomorrow. And don't forget to give me some feedback so that I can tailor these videos for you guys. I want to know how I can help you. I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about my timetable this week. So it's Tuesday and yesterday I was on the wards in the morning and then I was in the theatre in the afternoon. Like I said, I am on unit two this week, which is colorectal. And that is a small team of two interns, one registrar and two consultants. One of the consultants is actually away at the moment though, so just one consultant for this fortnight. She's just had a baby. <laughs> there are three different medical students attached to the team. We've just been allocated student one, two or three. I'm student three. Yesterday I was on the ward with the intern, so that just means doing jobs that come from the ward round and other unrelated jobs. Putting in cannulas and doing blood sometimes, doing referrals, writing up fluids, doing discharge summaries and discharge scripts. Today's Tuesday, I've got the whole day on the ward. Tomorrow, I'm just looking at my timetable here. I've got colonoscopies in the morning and then private theatre in the afternoon. We have theatre sessions either in the public system at the LGH or in private at St Vincent's for general surgery, which is just a short walk from the public hospital where we're usually based at. So that's really easy. 
but tomorrow I've actually got the mass casualty exercise. So I'll go to the wards in the morning to do the ward round and then probably won't be able to get to the other things after that. On Thursdays we have the grand round. So first we go around at the normal round time, 7 o'clock, and do our usual stuff. Then at 8 o'clock we as the students actually have a tutorial with one of the consultants. Then the path meeting is on 8, where all the gen surge teams sit down with the pathologist and they go through all the biopsies and the excisions that they've done, overlaying their professional opinion. I think that's mainly just for the really interesting cases. And then after the PATH meeting, the students present interesting patients um, in the round. So you just do like a one minute sort of talk about your patient and what the current plan is, which I think is a really good experience. It can be difficult as a student to know what the surgeons want to hear because there are lots of things that they're not interested in because while it might be important to the patient, it has nothing to do with what they need to do to move forward with the patient. And the other teams taking care of the patient, such as the medical teams, will do that sort of work. Anyway, it's a really good experience to get feedback and practice some succinct patient summaries. So then after the grand rounds on Thursday, we go back to the ward for a little bit and then in the afternoon we have specialty clinics. So that's just colorectal patients coming in and usually they're coming in for follow-up or they're being monitored by the um, consultant or registrar. The interns usually take their own patients in that clinic and sometimes as the students we get to take our own patients too with everything being communicated back to the registrar as a consultant. Friday for me is theatre in the morning and then wards in the afternoon. Tomorrow I will talk to you guys about the mass casualty exercise then because of tomorrow I'm not actually going to get into theatre until Friday. So I might talk to you about some of the operations that I've gotten to see later down the track. I suppose I can talk to you about the clinics soon. <laughs>
and the inferior mesenteric artery supplies the hindgut. The foregut includes the stomach and the first bit of the small bowel. We won't be talking about that today because we are focused on colorectal surgery. The SMA, the superior mesenteric artery, supplies the end part of the small bowel and then everything to just before the splenic flexure. So there's a watershed zone just before the splenic flexure on the transverse bowel. So the inferior mesenteric artery is left to supply the hindgut. So that's that little bit of transverse bowel, the splenic flexure, down into the sigmoid and just the superior part of the rectum. The rest of the rectum, the middle and the lower rectum is supplied by other branches of the aorta, but not those three main branches that we're talking about today. The middle part of the rectum is supplied by the internal iliac artery, and the most inferior part of the rectum is supplied by the internal pudendal artery. Each of these big branches of the aorta that supply the embryological sections of the gut have their own little branches coming off the artery. And this is really important to the surgeon because these smaller branches supply smaller subsections of the bowel, which means that the surgeon can take less if they can get away with it, which will leave the patient with more bowel and therefore better function in most cases. I won't go into those today, it's better seen by a picture. I might put in a picture for you guys or find a link because it is important to know and if you're on a surgical rotation you can bet that you're going to get quizzed on it because it is highly relevant and expected knowledge at a uh, clinical rotation level. Let's talk then about the basics of different bowel operations. So as a list to start with of important surgeries, we have total colectomy, segmental colectomy, right hemicolectomy, left hemicolectomy sigmoidectomy or sigmoid colectomy. And then down at the rectum, we have low anterior sections or abdominoperineal resections. First things first, the total colectomy. You can take out all of the colon and that is completely compatible with life. In this case, the surgeons will clamp the relevant arteries, dissect the mesentery and resect all the way down to the rectum. I saw a surgery on Monday, which was a total Monday, and they connected the small bowel that was left down to the top of the rectum. So this young lady would have been able to have reasonable bowel habits thereafter because we preserve the sphincter in her rectum, which gives you continence. Alternatively, if they weren't able to make that anastomosis, they could have pulled up a bit of the small bowel and made a stoma and stitched up the top of the rectum. On the other side of things, we can do a segmental colectomy where we can take a relatively small part of the bowel and again, and that is based on those small branching arteries that come off the bigger arteries. As long as we remove all of the bowel that no longer has a blood supply after the artery has been clamped, so anastomose the adjacent bowel. Now, getting into more specifics, we have the right colectomy. And within the right colectomy, we have a limited right colectomy or an extended right colectomy. The limited right colectomy includes the terminal ileum down to the cecum, the ascending colon, and then the hepatic flexure. Clamp the arteries, resect the bowel. That is usually used for a lesion between the cecum and the ascending colon. This person will therefore end up with an iliocolic anastomosis, so a connection between the small bowel and the transverse colon. Alternatively, they could have an ileostomy, so a stoma of the small bowel. In that case, they would sew or staple the transverse bowel and they'll bring out the ileum through the abdominal wall. Ileum? Um, the extended right colectomy includes everything that we just talked about, but they also take a bit of the transcending colon. The left hemicolectomy is apparently not done as much anymore, and I indeed have not seen one on my placement so far. This is usually done for a descending colon tumor. The splenic flexure and the descending colon are resected, and then the transverse colon and the sigmoid colon are anastomose. Alternatively, again, you could sew or staple the distal end and then bring the proximal end, i.e. the transverse colon, up for a colostomy. The sigmoidectomy is pretty self-explanatory. The lesion is in the sigmoid, we resect the sigmoid, and then we anastomose the descending colon to the upper rectum. Now going on to the surgeries related to the rectum, we can do a low anterior resection, or you can do an abdominal perineal resection. A low anterior section is for a lesion in the upper two thirds of the rectum. These people will usually get a temporary colostomy. So we bring up that sigma colon through the abdominal wall to make a stoma and seal off the lower part of the rectum. Later on, we can come back and anastomose those two pieces together and then hopefully the person will have a pretty reasonable functional bowel after that. Now the final surgery, the abdominal perineal resection, you have a surgical approach through the abdomen and then also through the anus. So what happens is you actually divide the sigmoid column and you resect everything distal to that. From the bottom, you resect all of the anus all the musculature associated and all the way up through the middle of the sigmoid. So for this person, the anus is stitched up and they will have a permanent colostomy. This is typically done for those with a lesion in the lower part of their rectum that involves the musculature. And the most important point is that they won't have any sphincter function, so they need to have a colostomy to have any control of the bowels. Another procedure that might come up for you is the Hartman's procedure. In this procedure, they resect the sigmoid and I think a bit of the rectum. And a colostomy is formed, so the descending colon is brought up through the abdominal wall. You have a stoma and then the top of the rectum is sewn off. Now this can be used if the surgeon is not comfortable that if they were to connect the two ends that were left that it would heal well. By creating a diverting stoma we can give the bowel a bit of time to have a break, a bit of time for inflammation to resolve, swelling to go down and 
get the patient back into a place where their bowel can heal really well. Good nutrition, good blood supply, no infection, ischemia, as little inflammation as possible. The Hartman's procedure is a temporary solution to take some time to harvest those conditions to make sure our seal is great. If you form an anastomosis that leaks, that can cause ongoing problems for the patient. They might end up very sick in the meantime and ultimately back in the theatre again. So they're my basics that I've learned on colorectal surgeries over my placement so far. I hope they are helpful for you. Throw me any questions down below as per usual. I better get back to it. Oh.